Hello and welcome back to Rev Real Estate School. I'm your host, Michael Montgomery, and today we're joined by Chris Adam. Chris Adam's a close friend of mine and an amazing real estate agent. He is part of a brokerage of over 900 real estate agents in my same market in Calgary. And he managed at the end of last year to reach the top 5%. And this is like one of the biggest real estate brokerages that I have ever seen. And so it's an amazing feat. And I'm really excited to chat with Chris for a number of reasons. But Chris has had a very interesting career path. And oftentimes in real estate, we're always trying to think of what's the next lead generation strategy. We're thinking through online leads, door knocking, open houses, different strategies like that. And Chris has gone a little bit of a different direction with all of this. And that's why I'm really excited to chat with him and to dive into how he's built his business. So Chris, how are you doing today? Hey, Mike. Great to be here. Uh, doing, doing well. It's a little rainy in Calgary, but uh, nevertheless, a good, a good day. It's a little rainy, but these like we, uh, we've been dealing with forest fires all around us for like all summer. So I'm actually pretty happy about it in a, yeah. in a sense. But the nice thing about no rain is I haven't had to mow my lawn. So now I have to start mowing my exactly. lawn. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. But Chris, really excited to have you and to dive into your business as a whole. But how did you get your start in real estate? Let's start with that. And then let's talk about how you actually grew within the industry. So talk to us a little bit about how you started in this industry. Yeah. So this is actually my sixth year of being a, a full-time licensed agent. I've always been absolutely just fascinated by real estate. Even, it sounds cheesy, but uh, growing up as a kid, I was always interested in where people lived and how they lived and just seeing the differences, whether it was visiting like a family member in an apartment downtown or being at one of my friends out in the suburbs, it just drastically affected how people lived their day-to-day -day life. I've always had a, an interest in kind of design and architecture and things like that. So it, it was always kind of in the, the back of my head. Obviously, you, it's very rare to see someone hop out of high school and straight into the business, although it can happen. So chose a little bit of a different uh, career path for, for several years and then decided to, to hop in once I had kind of a good skill set and a good foundation. Yeah, I think that's really exciting because you're, you're, you're definitely right. Like a lot of people, myself included, we kind of fall into real estate in, in many ways and it's usually not done like right out of university or right out of high school. So it's everyone kind of has these meandering paths. But what, was, what really jumped out at me when I was thinking about your business is the fact that you started your business and you had a very strong start. For most people, it's going to be two to three year process to actually get the gears turning and the wheels turning in order to produce enough to kind of keep the lights on at home. But for you, you hit the ground running. And so can you walk us through why was that? What, what contributed to your early success in this career? A lot of it was my previous career was in business development and marketing. So that lent itself extremely well to get into that in this business that's primarily what we what we do but i've also always been like an extrovert where it just comes natural meeting people talking to them asking them questions being just curious about who who they are so i'm always that person that talks to to strangers and of course my spouse always rolls their their eyes uh when it happens and things like that because i'll chat up the cashier at the grocery store even. But prior to launching in real estate, I just, I knew a lot of people in the city, different contacts that I've met, friends, acquaintances, you name it. And it wasn't really something that occurred to me until kind of the first year when meeting other new agents who they're all worried and anxious about setting up their database and maybe only have 50, 60 people in it. I had to edit and pare down what I had. Yeah, to totally. And I think that's, that's truly why your career kicked off so strong. And a lot of people who do start real estate with a strong start, it's because they bring this, this database or people with them yeah. into the industry because you've, you've done a lot of the legwork. And I think a lot of times when we get into real estate, we think of getting into real estate and then starting the legwork. And there's nothing wrong with that. And most people will end up taking that path. So let's say that you were talking to a brand new real estate agent and they thought to themselves, 
okay, well, I haven't been, I haven't been in a business that was business development and I haven't grown my network. So if you were to give them a few quick tips on like how to start building their network, like you did, what would you suggest they do? I think first things first, it's important to take account of everyone that you do know and mm -hmm. classify them. I mean, we see that often with CRMs and things like that. CRMs can be very intimidating when you first get in. So even if you're dropping it into an Excel spreadsheet, just have a list of, of people who you need to maintain contact with, even if it's just a casual text message or uh, reaching out to them on Facebook for a birthday wish or something like that. Just really having that list is, is paramount. Yeah. It's going to be your foundation because you can take plans from there. Yeah, to totally. I, having that list, regardless of the size of the list, I think even if you're, because you, where my mind's going with this, both you and I are not like native to this city that we're both transacting yeah. in. We both have, are transplanted into this city and had to build our networks kind of from scratch in many ways. One thing that I'd love to ask you, you were mentioning that you're on the extroverted side, but Walk me through the life of an extrovert. Like even before you were in real estate, like what, what are you doing throughout the week in order to connect with more people and grow your database and start to make these contacts with people that eventually in real estate ended up transacting with you, but kind of take me back to even when you moved to the city and how you grew your network from there. That's tough because it's, it's sometimes completely like subliminal and you're not even realizing that you're engaging with people. So it's really like joining clubs and activities and, and rec league sports and things like that. Just getting in front of people where you can build those relationships. There's no one way that I did it. It's just from continually interacting, meeting people and showing a genuine interest in, in who they are. Like I've made a lot of great friendships, don't get me wrong. That's always kind of the the first primary reason why I'm social with people. And then as you develop and nurture those relationships, at some point they're gonna be in some sort of a life uh, cycle of buying or selling. And just maintaining that uh, relationship and conversation so that they are aware that you're in this business and they think of you first when it comes time uh, for a transaction. Totally. Yeah. That, that makes perfect sense. The way that I tend to kind of, and let me know if I'm wrong about this, but the way that I kind of think about it is like you, and even when I reach out to you, you're like out doing things for the most part, like almost every night of the week. Now I know that that's probably not in reality, how it actually looks. You have your Netflix nights and things like yeah, that. Yeah. hundred percent. But like, it's like every weekend you have some sort of party, some sort of event, something that you're going to, or you're going to multiple parties and multiple events. And I know even like, whether it be somebody listening to this or even myself, sometimes I'm like, I just don't even want to go to the, I just want to sit at home and do nothing yet. You always seem to be going and doing these things. And it's, is it because it, a, like you enjoy it or are you doing it because you're also seeing it as work or is it a combination? It is a combination. I've definitely slowed down over the years. I'm married to someone who's very introverted, so that doesn't always mesh well. However, it's, it's just part of my life to stay busy. And I, I find that even when I'm on vacation, it's always hard to have that kind of beach vacation where you just lay on the beach and read a book. I constantly need to be doing something or some sort of an activity. So it's, I think it's more ingrained with me and it's something I don't even realize that I'm doing often. Yeah, exactly. It's became like second nature to you. Right. But can you walk me through even whether it be kind of, let's even say earlier on in your career when you were still really trying to scale up and grow your business? Yeah. Like how often would you say you're out at events or parties or things throughout the week on a, on a traditional week? Usually three or four times. And it can just be a small social gathering or someone's birthday or an event and things like that. And just in natural conversation, it seems like everyone is fascinated by by real estate or always has a question even if they're not currently looking to buy or sell we all get asked how's the market and it's important to stay on top of the news cycles and statistics and things like that and remember a couple key talking points so that you establish yourself as that guy who's credible knows what they're talking about 
and can provide value. So I've, I mean, I, I read the news every single day. I know what's going on with the interest rates and the economy. And you can take bits and pieces of information to share with people. And that usually gets them intrigued enough that if they are actively looking, they want to follow up that conversation outside of the social setting. Totally. Totally. And you, you know what? Like, I think so many times there's training around somebody asks about the market and then there's like this contrived script on how to get them towards like, well, what part of the market are you interested? Are you interested in buying or selling? And you kind of like are trying to lead generate just from that question. And my personal preference is to stay away from that. And exactly yeah. like you're saying is just have a point of view on the market and provide information on what's going on. We don't have to try in every conversation, try and convert every single person because that repels so many people. And they see right Big through time. that. But if you can just yeah. have an open, educated conversation about what's going on in the market, then the conversions tend to naturally happen. Yeah, it's uh, the a great book, and I think you might have actually given it to me. Gave it to me is uh, the Go Giver, and whatever you do, always try to provide value to who you're interacting with, and genuinely, just think of it as a duty that I'm sharing with you my knowledge of what the real estate market is right now. And I don't expect anything from it other than informing you. Totally. I think that's a really, I think that's a really good point. And actually I found in my career that my production increased and this is almost happens to everybody. Your production starts to increase the less that you care about actually converting. You know what I mean? Like the more that okay. you just have a true human to human conversation and I'm like, you can use me or you can use any other agent out there. It really doesn't matter to me. And then that's yeah. where these like natural fun, like friendly conversations occur. And then conversions actually increase from there. But when we try to tr convert everybody in every conversation, it, people see right through it. Not to mention, I just don't even like the conversation. I just feel like I'm trying to push somebody down a road that they may not want to go. Yeah. And it's, I mean, for, for newer agents, it's, it's hard to understand, but oftentimes you're planting the seed that will develop way long, longer on. Very rarely, even right now in my business, do I meet someone and then three weeks later it results in a meeting at their dining room table to, to buy or sell. It's developing that relationship, that point of contact and then staying the course and nurturing it over time. Whether it's this year, next year, um, it, it usually pans out. You're gonna obviously lose some along the way, but it's, it is a long game and patience is everything. Totally, totally. I'm so glad you said that. It is, it is such a long game and it's such a long sales cycle too. It's just not a phone call today and a sale tomorrow. But, and I wanna get further into this concept of lead generation with you because as we were saying off the very start, your lead generation strategy, it's always, we, we work together too, actually. And it was always very interesting to me because so many times people want to know, like, what's the lead generation strategy that is going to get me a hundred leads a day. And all of these people are going to be looking to buy and sell. And oftentimes our minds go to these different strategies, like, you know, cold calling or prospecting expires. If you're in a market where you're allowed to do that or online lead generation. And these, this is kind of where our mind goes, but walk me through kind of these more traditional lead generation strategies and a have you tried them and if you have have any of them worked i'm just very curious to hear your response to that so out of 170 plus transactions not one of them has ever been from a cold call uh, an online lead even a sign call um, on one of my listings I, everyone has their own source of business. It's never been something that I've been interested in pursuing because I already have a pretty robust and healthy database. Don't get me wrong. If I have a sign call on one of my listings, I will still show it uh, to get maximum exposure on my listing and find feedback and things like that. However, I don't, really try to cultivate or nurture that lead. And it's, it's just something that isn't within my business. A lot of colleagues of mine, they make a very successful living by hosting open houses and getting leads and building those relationships that way. It's never been anything that has interested me, um, even door knocking. So for me, it's just meeting new people organically in my day-to-day -day life, 
building those relationships, those friendships, acquaintances, things like that, and then staying in touch with them. That's so interesting. And actually, like so many times our minds are trying to go to all these different strategies when in reality, if you talk to if you talk to 100 real estate agents, you ask them, what's their main source of business? 99 out of those 100 are going to say repeat and referral and sphere of influence. Like they're all going to say that that's the, that is the majority of their business. Maybe 1% is going to get all of their business from some other yeah. strategy. Yet we tend to focus so much effort on these other strategies that's not focused on just meeting new people and growing our database. And so to kind of follow this thread a little bit further, yeah. if someone's listening and they're like, okay, well, Chris is going out three to four times a week. So Okay, we got to be out three to four times a week, which actually I think is a, a really good, we tend to suggest at a minimum two times a week, you have to be out. Yeah. So we're going out three to four times a week. But then I want to get into this concept of staying in touch, which is something that um, I won't put too many words in your mouth, because I'll let you kind of yeah. speak to this. But I'll just give you my interpretation from somebody who you have stayed in touch with. So me being on the receiving end of you staying in touch. And Chris will send me text messages or call me sometimes out of the blue. And he has these little tidbits of information and he could. So for example, the last text message he sent me was about a new photography company in, in our city. That's doing some really cool stuff. Now, Chris knows a million different agents. You could have sent that text to so many different people. And maybe you did. I'm actually curious if you did, but you sent it to me. And all I thought in my mind is, wow, like he's staying in touch and he didn't have to like, let me know about this new photography company, but he did so. And he reached out and he shared his photos. And I was like, this is such a perfect example of Chris doing what Chris does. He just stays in touch with people. But is that, did I like pop up in your CRM or did you just think, Hey, this is kind of something cool that I think other agents would get value from. It's, it's completely genuine and organic. I wish yeah. I was that organized where I had kind of a, a system that, told me to to reach out every six weeks to you but it's it's just once again about those relationships where you and i have always operated very similarly in our in our uh, business and when you're proud of something or have something cool you want to share with someone don't hesitate just drop someone a quick note and that's all it takes i'm not expecting to engage in a long winded conversation about photography with you. It's just, Hey, I thought you might enjoy this. Here you go. You can respond. You can hit like on the text message, but that's just one touch point. And that's often how I just maintain a lot of the, the relationships. I'm not sending people detailed emails or things like that. It's just, Hey, I saw your vacation on Facebook. Looked like you had a great time. We should get together soon or something to that effect where once again, it's always very genuine, but it's just maintaining that relationship. Yeah, absolutely. And, but you do this so well, and I think you do it naturally very well. And like, even for myself, it doesn't come naturally. Like in a sense, I almost need a CRM to remind me, but it, it this was just one small example, of course, yeah. but I know that you're likely doing this with your clients too. And you're just sending them these small little text messages probably, or giving them a quick call and asking them how their vacation was. And I think a lot of times in our minds, we get up in our own heads a lot and we're like, oh, I don't know if that warrants a text message or a phone call, or yeah. they're gonna think this is ridiculous with me sending this. Do those thoughts ever go through your mind? A little bit. I mean, it's, it's always something that I it, have to think about and be aware of. Um, like if I haven't reached out to someone in two years and then out of the blue, I better have a good reason for getting in touch. And oftentimes if I'm struggling to find something, uh, especially with existing homeowners or whatever, they are still curious about what's going on around them. So if there's a property on their street, that's very identical, I won't hesitate to be like, Hey, I know I haven't chatted with you in forever, but I just saw this and thought of you and just wanted to let you know that a house a couple blocks down, I'm sure you've saw the, the sold sign get slapped on. Here's what it sold for. And most people are very appreciative of that information. And I never expect a response, which is important. How I phrase it and how I go about it is just, Hey, I was thinking about you. I wanted to reach out to you. 
here's some information. You can never contact me again, or you can reply with something. <laughs> um, that, that's implied. That part's implied. You don't actually yeah. say that. Yeah. No. But I, but I, I'm really curious about this now. Okay. So if you're, if you're doing that, like how many people respond to those messages that you send and either don't respond at all or respond in some negative light? Like what, what percentage? I'm guessing it's fairly low, but I'd be curious. Yeah. I haven't really had any negative reactions to it. Um, there's some people that just won't reply or they'll read it and then maybe reply the week later. Um, I'm not really too consumed with how that goes. Um, but it's when I need also something or a reason to reach out, like I don't do a lot of external advertising. You won't see my name or face on billboards or bus benches, even on social media, I will promote my listings and push them out as paid ads, but I generally don't have any just static ads running. Where I invest my money is on little touch points, whether it be during the summer, getting a stack of gift cards for an ice cream shop and just sending them out in a little handwritten note saying, hope you guys are having a great summer. Here's a treat on me. It's just those little touch points where sure, sending a $10 gift card times a hundred sounds super expensive, but it goes to maintain those existing relationships where the other alternative is spending a couple hundred or several hundred bucks a month on bus benches or external advertising. And a lot of agents won't hesitate to do that because it's building their brand. I'd much rather spend my resources and invest in the people that I already know than go out searching for new people. Uh, that's such an important point. That's such an important point because so many times we, and, and I've done this too, like I've had no problem spending, you know, five, 10 K a month on, on ads, but you're talking about spending a thousand dollars in the summer months to send out an ice cream cone card to a hundred people. And that thousand dollars is probably the best return on investment of any real estate investment that you can possibly make. When you start investing in these people that you already know, like the, the return on that, on that spend is astronomical compared to the return you get from, you know, buying a handful of Facebook leads or something like that. One thing that I've done since early, early on is, uh, for new home owners, I'll get custom Christmas ornaments made that say my first Christmas in the neighborhood name and then the year. I just find someone off of Etsy and they're about $15 an ornament plus shipping. It's several hundred bucks. And I will take one day in December and hand deliver each one of them. It's so thoughtful, everyone loves them. I don't know if they actually go up on the tree or if they just get tossed. However, it's another touch point. And so it's, it's cost me say a couple thousand bucks over the years of doing this every year. They only get it the first year. <laughs> yeah. Um, however, I can tie back three referrals just to having the conversations on people's front step saying, Oh, Hey, actually I've been meaning to talk to you. My brother's looking to buy. Well, that netted a good $8,000 in commission by going down that and, and, um, making sure that people feel like you're still interested in them. Oh, I love that. I love that. And I like that you hand deliver them too. Etsy's so powerful. We do that for, if somebody has uh, a child and has a new child, we, deliver these little, um, bibs, I guess, with their, with their name on them. That's and again, one. it's like $15. And honestly, like it's such a big moment for them that just by sending this little thing from Etsy has led to so much future business just from sending this little, this little, very simple touch point. And it's great that you're delivering it in person. I need to be better. I just send them directly from Etsy, but that's a, that's a really nice touch point. Yeah. Some, some outside of the city do get purulated, but Nevertheless, I try to try to deliver them, especially at a time that they're going to be home, like whether it's an evening or a weekend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Um, talk to me a little bit about your social media strategy and if you have a social media strategy and then how you approach posting in, in general. For me, it's one of those things where even in my personal life and my personal accounts, I never think that anything that I'm doing is interesting enough to share with people. So I basically, I honestly do the bare, the bare minimum on my professional accounts just so people know that I'm still alive, still practicing in real estate and transacting. However, I look at social media as an opportunity to pull information more than push information out. So I, like everyone else, I'm always on my phone scrolling through, seeing people's vacation photos or when they have a new kid or a new puppy or something like that. And I mentally kind of register that, okay, that's a major life event. They might be eventually looking. Once again, it still comes from a place of genuine care about this person and congratulating them. However, it's also registering that, hey, that change that I'm seeing within their life on social media may result in them needing to move to a bigger house or change their, their living uh, accommodations. So I'll still push uh, information out like market stats and my own listings and things like that. However, I'm not a prolific poster like a lot of some agents are. And do you think that, so are you using social media more as, you, I really like this term, how you said you're pulling information versus pushing information. I really like that visual. So you're using it more so, you're doing what you need to do in order to stay relevant, of course, by posting yeah. on social. Bare minimum. But, yeah, exactly. But you're using it more as a tool to extract information so that you have opportunities to reach out. Is that is that really how you see it when you're scrolling through Instagram and you're looking at posts? You're doing so because you're interested, but you're also doing so to see if there's any opportunities to reach out? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's it's so easy to send a quick like or even write on a post or something. I generally will take it offline where I'll send them, especially if I'm already have that relationship established, I'll send them a text um, saying, hey, I hope you're having a great day, happy birthday, rather than being one out of 150 that are just posting on their Facebook page saying happy birthday. It just sets you out a little bit apart. And then if there's something else like a new job or something like that, it also gives me an opportunity to further that conversation if they are receptive to that. Yeah, that makes that makes perfect sense. And then would you say that as far as like how you're doing your business, the so social media is kind of where all of your clients are going. So they're all in there basically. And then you're using that as information to then reach out. And are you doing so mostly over text message, mostly over the phone, mostly over email, or is, do you have a preferred channel of how you reach out to people? And is there a reason why? It depends on the, the person themselves and how formal it is. And like, you really have to assess the situation and take the read of your relationship with that person. And then also what you're reaching out for. I think it, it should be kept casual so that it's genuine if if i'm sending an email happy birthday it kind of reads to me like i have it in some database and it's just an automatic trigger where it just needs to be once again a genuine conversation so generally it's it's over text message which is quick i mean how many hundreds of text messages do we all send in a week so that's generally what i'm what i'm doing final question around this then we'll then we'll jump into your systems but do you do you mark down or do you track when you send a text message to somebody in your crm at all or anything like that or is it just do you track that at all or is it just when it comes to mind you're sending it so that's i think every agent out there even the most successful the crm is always a work in progress it's mm -hmm. something that you have to set time aside to work at and it's only as good as what you do with it. Um, for the last several months, I've been using Close with a Z. Um, it's out of the United States. I found it on Inman. There was a bunch of articles written about it. What's great is it has an app that syncs all of your text messages and pulls them in to that contact. So when I go in on my desktop and pull up John Smith 
it shows me all the emails, all the text messages, and it really kind of creates it um, in a nice timeline so I can see, oh wow, the last time I talked to you was 16 months ago. It might be time to somehow reach out. And it's it just keeps things organized without me having to do much because it automatically syncs every day. That's really nice that it syncs with text messages. There's very yeah. few, see, actually I don't even know of any that without actually getting your own, your own private number. Question for you though, let's say that somebody does come up that you haven't reached out to in 16 months and that person does come up. How do you end up reaching out to somebody like that? Who you just haven't been in touch with and you're, and we've all been there where we're like, shoot, I really should have reached out. And now you're kind of delaying it. So how do you reach out to that person? Or do you put a lot of thought into it? Or is it just a quick and easy reach out? You know, what's, what's interesting is I'm, I'm actually working with a couple right now that I helped them buy their first property the very first year I was in business. And I did kind of lose touch with them. However, you have to make sure that you're friendly enough and doing good enough job when you're working with them. There's that major component. They have to be happy with how the experience went. They were the ones that reached out. And I, I just kind of welcomed them with open arms saying like, oh my God, I'm so happy to hear from you after all this time. I, my apologies. I should have been keeping in touch with you, but just focus on the here and now what how can i help what's going on in your life reconnect we all have those friends from high school and things like that that we might not talk to on a, even a yearly basis but you're able to pick up where you left off so always make sure that you're leaving any situation in in a good condition so that you can pick it up again whenever you need to that's a good way of putting it yeah leave everything on on good terms and then yeah but, but you know what's interesting is like sometimes people reach out to me who haven't been in touch in a really long time and I'm, I'm guessing like, hey, it's time to reach out to Mike. It's, you know, they, they haven't been in touch. It's maybe some service provider or something like that. But never have I gotten a, a message from somebody who hasn't been in touch with me for a while and me being thinking to them or thinking to myself, wow, this person isn't good at staying in touch. Like every single time I receive that message, I'm always like delighted to get the message and thinking, I wonder how that this person's doing too. And it just has me start to think about that person. Of course, being in the real estate space, it causes us to pause and be like, okay, well, I must've popped up in their CRM. But then I get to thinking, they probably overthought texting me too. They probably thought, oh, I don't know. He might respond negatively, but yeah. I can say being on the receiving end, I have never responded negatively to that. I've always been very excited to like see somebody pop up my phone that I haven't chatted with for a while. Absolutely. And I mean, even if it's like you've completely lost touch with them and say you're at the five year mark since they purchased, that's still a good reason to be like, Hey, I just wanted to reach out. Can you believe that it's been five years in your house already? I really enjoyed working with you back then. If there's anything or any information I can provide you, let me know. Super simple. Just yeah. Yeah, leave it at that. Simple simple. I love it. Yeah. Walk me through some of your systems though, Chris, because now moving from kind of the lead generation and staying in touch with people towards the actual like client and customer experience side, what sort of systems have you set up for yourself? Cause you're doing a lot of business. You're, you're a very high producing solo agent. How are you able to manage all of this? Technology. Yeah. <laughs> Basically everything needs to be put in my calendar. Um, I still use good old fashioned sticky notes of what I need to accomplish each morning. That way it's right in front of me and I can't miss it. However, I really do rely on making lists, checklists, things like that of what I need to go through. And once again, a good web-based calendar that connects with my phone and, and whatnot. That way it's hard to forget about anything because it's right in front of you. Yeah, a lot of it is not so much automated. I'm still in complete control. However, I do rely on, on templates because a lot of what we do is very systematized. So I always want to make sure that I'm giving my clients the information before they need it. So at every major milestone within a transaction, they'll get an email that says, here's the next steps. Here's where we're at. Here's what you need to know. Here's what happens next. And it is a template. However, I'll still go through and kind of curate it for each situation. That's great. 
Yeah, the next the next steps email is something I, I've been setting that up for years, and I always think, does anybody? You taught me that, yeah. What, but like, I always think, does anybody even read these? Because it's kind of a long templated email. But I actually had a client. This was like a month ago, and they were using another agent before they came over to us, and they never received like a next steps email because they were conditionally sold on a property that fell through, and then they came over and we helped them buy, and they were blown away by this simple next steps templated email. It's like these are your dates, these are the numbers, this is everything you have to keep track of and it was it, it like blew their socks off and they but it was just a simple act really of, and it's a very simple template but it, it goes such a long way with clients sometimes we don't even realize totally and it i mean a lot of it is for selfish reasons it makes our lives easier too i will still gladly take that phone call from the client and explain to them over the phone what they need to do but it's also something that functions as a checklist for them to refer back to part of my crm has like an email tracker so i can actually see how many times someone will open that email and usually it's multiple multiple times um, mm -hmm. so i do know that i that for the most part they'll find it uh, quite valuable yeah, absolutely. I use, well, my CRM does that too, but I also use this tool called, I think it's called MailTrack and it's just an integration with Gmail and every email I send is tracked. And then it sends me a notification if they open the email a lot in a short period of time. So if like the analytics are showing that they're opening it a lot yeah. in a short period of time, I'll get notified of that. Or if somebody who I sent an email to like two years ago reopens an email, I get notified of that too. It's just, it's so interesting the the power of some of these tools that we have. The other thing that I wanted to discuss with you is this concept of failure in real estate, which we've all kind of dealt with our challenging situations in, in real estate. And we'll all deal with more as, as time goes on. But is there any one moment or any failure that you think you've had and how you've been able to bounce back from it? I think some of the biggest things I've learned in my career has been a result of either a mistake or not doing something or doing something the wrong way, even in this kind of challenging market we're in right now, I'm constantly using what I've learned and the results uh, on a daily basis to kind of further refine how I operate. When there has been a mistake, I think it's, especially if it's something with a client or something that they're unhappy with, it's very important to be transparent, take ownership and have that conversation. Once again, it's part of any relationship with friends or spouses, there's gonna be some sort of a disagreement or something like that. However, it's important to communicate, find out what they were expecting, if it's a misalignment or something like that. Apologize if need be, and then find a path forward. How can I overcome this and go above and beyond to make this situation better? But in terms of making small mistakes or errors or anything like that, use it as a learning opportunity to further refine how you conduct your business. Totally. And I think that that Rick, reframing them as learning opportunities, because we're, we're not going to be perfect. It's a career in real estate that kind of demands almost perfection in certain ways, right? Like you drop the ball on a sale and it can mean it, it can be just a tremendous issue for sellers and buyers for that matter. So we end up taking on a lot, but I find that most issues are communication issues. Like most things can be solved with an empathetic and sad times direct phone conversation or in-person conversation. Like the communication element is typically where things I find go south. If we're not communicating or we're under communicating or we're avoiding that hard conversation that we all know we need to have. Absolutely. And, and having a read of the, the person that you're actually dealing with. I mean, every situation is unique. However, there's been times where, yeah, if we had a collapse sale, I remember driving all the way to the client's house because I didn't feel like it was sufficient enough to give them a call. That was a conversation I showed up on their front door and wanted to have in person. So it's really always taking the temperature of the relationship of who you're working with and what you need to, to communicate and, and using your common sense. 
That's a, that's impressive. So you was this recently? You showed up at some at a seller's house when the deal collapsed? No, that uh, thankfully enough was a couple of years ago, um, and it just the, the the transaction went sideways, and I was kind of blindsided. So I knew that they would be too. So it's it's always easier to deliver news. I mean. For me, it would just be easier to pick up the phone and say, hey, sorry, this isn't working. You're like, <laughs> this isn't worked out. But I felt it was necessary to, to actually drive down there. And they, it was like a 25 minute drive from where I live. So, But it's those little things to show your clients that you're fully committed and right by their side at every moment. Yeah, exactly. Like you're on, you're on the same team and that's, that's really what it's, what it's showing. Let's say though, that you were talking right now to somebody who's newer in the industry, maybe got in the industry in the last two or three years, kind of struggling to, to get the wheels turning. What suggestions would you have for a newer agent who's starting up their business in this day and age? I haven't thought about this. Like if I ever moved cities what would i do how would i start over again and i mean we touched on it at the beginning but i didn't grow up here i've been here for 15 years and when i moved here i knew three people so it is a little bit of a process one thing would be to just keep yourself busy um there's multiple different ways if you're in a larger office you can connect with some existing agents if they need help with their buyer leads sign calls open houses just get in front of people um, alternatively you could join clubs activities join a soccer team something like that where you'll find people um, and it is a slow process but it's it's one that if you um, strategize correctly will pay dividends mm -hmm. yeah yeah you just got to get out of the house like the, the more that yeah. agents can just get out of the house and not overthink you know trying to find the perfect club or the perfect event or it has to be the perfect birthday party and you have to be wearing the right thing and it has to you know be the the right moon cycle like all of this stuff is just us getting into our our own way we just need to leave the house more talk to more yeah. people and our real estate business will grow. It, it, and oftentimes the biggest limit limiter there is not the number of events that we have to choose from. It's, it tends to be ourselves really. Yeah, absolutely. Another, uh, great book, or I actually listened to it. The audiobook was, uh, um, the five second rule. I think it's mm -hmm. Mel Robbins. Robbins. Yeah. Yeah. And it's such a simple concept, but that has helped me throughout where I'll hesitate or dwell on reaching out to someone, but you can spend more energy and more time worrying about it than that phone call actually takes. So just do it. Yeah, it is, it's a good strategy. Like it's so simplistic, right? But it's, it, it's effective because it just shows us, this is one thing that I've always noticed, like the longer I delay between when I know I need to do something and when that thing happens, the longer I delay, the harder it becomes. And Big honestly, time. the more, the more resort mental resources it takes to, cause I keep thinking, you know, I got to do this. I got to go out to more events. I got to start doing this more. And so it's constantly in my mind occupying so much mind space. And the longer I wait, traditionally, the harder it becomes. It's the same thing with dealing with a difficult phone conversation. The more I put off talking to that seller, the harder that conversation becomes versus me just preparing for five minutes and picking up the phone and dialing. All right, Chris, so final question here. If an agent's listening to this, you've been in the industry for long enough where you've seen some agents come, you've seen agents go, you've seen agents grow, you've seen certain agents, of course, have to hang up their license and move out of the industry. So when you're thinking through all the different strategies and everything that agents are doing out there, what's one or a couple things that come to mind when I say, what are some things that agents need to stop doing? There's definitely a long list. Um, but first and foremost, I think a lot of agents will let their own egos get in the way, whether it's how they market themselves or even conduct business. We're all individual business people, um, but we, the reality is we need to work together. So I might run my business a certain way, but I'll be on the other side of a transaction from someone who operates it in a completely different way. I always look at my 
role or goal in the transaction is to build that bridge in between the seller, the buyer that I'm working with and who's ever representing the other side and try to find that kind of common ground to get a deal done that makes both of our clients happy. So oftentimes, like I'll, I'll always pick up the phone. A lot of agents I'll find will want to text and when we're negotiating or something like that. There's so many little nuances within negotiations that are lost over just a two sentence text message. This is a major component of what we do and you should devote quite a bit of energy to, to doing it. So I will always, even before I launch uh, an offer or anything like that, I'll pick up the phone and call that agent to start developing that relationship. So many people are terrified to do that, but it goes a long way. Um, to just get get the offer accepted or reassure them that I have everything organized ahead of time. So a lot of it is just kind of hiding behind a, a screen. Yeah, that's a that's a really good suggestion. The, but this point around building relationships with agents in the industry, I think it's one that's undervalued. And a lot of times we think, okay, well, we gotta you know stand up for our clients, and you can stand up for your client while still trying to create a win-win environment for everybody. And if you come at a negotiation as an agent and you have this image in your mind of what a negotiator does, which is I'm gonna win and you're going to lose, and you're going to you know, educate me on market conditions as to why I need to come to certain price or something like that, it, not only does the deal not get done, but the chances of us doing a deal together and having that work out smoothly in the future is also is also l less likely. And I find that like when I am getting multiple offers and if I am listing a home and I get 10 offers on it and two of those agents I know really well and are dealing with with clients that I know are likely pre-approved and ready to write and and then there's another agent who kind of has everything misspelled in the email and didn't reach out and the offers half filled out even if the number's higher, almost always the seller is going to go with the agent who we're suggesting is probably dealing with a buyer who's a little bit stronger. And I think a lot of times we just think that one deal and then on to the next one, but that's not the case. The more that we're able to build these strong relationships with other agents in the industry, the higher likelihood our future deals are going to get done with them. No, absolutely. And I mean, like both of us are in the same market. We are, oh. I guess, would be considered competitors. But back to that relationship where I want to maintain that because, I mean, we've done deals, a couple deals over the years. And because I trust you and know you and understand your operating style, there's already that relationship established and understanding of how things are going to play out. So it's not just relationships of our own clients. It's also with feather, fellow colleagues that I try to maintain and develop. And you're right. If, if something does sour and normally it's not because of my side, yeah. um, I'm always a little bit hesitant and gun shy to work with that person in the future. So it's important. We're, we're only as good as our reputations. Yeah, I think, I think that's not something that, especially in faster markets where deals are just kind of getting done sometimes, or it feels like deals are just getting done, we don't put as much emphasis on the relationship that we have with the other agent. And if we were just like better to one another, I know things are hard and sometimes you have clients yelling in your ear and then you have to go and try and communicate something over to the other side and it's challenging. But the more that I think that we can be empathetic and trying to work in a win-win capacity, that doesn't mean that we're not advocating for our client. But mm -hmm. if I'm representing a buyer and you're representing a seller, we want the buyer to feel like they won, but we also want the seller to feel like they won. We want both parties to ultimately feel like they won in this transaction. And that's a successful transaction. If one feels like they're losing, there's an, it's, it's less likely the deal's even gonna get done. Because if a seller feels like they're getting taken advantage of, the chances of them actually accepting that offer are pretty slim. So there's just like being able to form that bond, I think is key and something that you do really well. Yeah, once again, it's all relationship and communication. Yeah, exactly. Chris, if somebody wants to reach out to you to connect, get any ideas or just discuss with you, what's the best way that they can reach out or follow you? My website is chrisadam.com. Email is chris at chrisadam.com. 
and uh, Instagram and uh, Facebook is chrisadam.cir. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Chris. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.